Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nonviolence Radio. I'm your host, Stephanie Van Hook, and I'm here in the studio with my co host and Nonviolence Report news anchor, Michael Negler. Today on the show, we'll be speaking with Kelly Denton Borhog, and she's been long investigating how religion and violence collide in American war culture. She teaches in the Global Religions Department at Moravian University, and she's the author of two books, U.S. War Culture, Sacrifice and Salvation, and more recently, And Then Your Soul is Gone, Moral Injury and U.S. War Culture. So we want to welcome Kelly to Nonviolence Radio this morning. Good morning, Kelly. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me on your program. Yes. And this is a very important topic for us to discuss uh, war culture in America and the violence that it does to the people, not only that it encounters on the outside, but from the inside, and how we can then apply nonviolence to this formula, to what is happening, in order to get a broader picture of why nonviolence is so urgent and important in our world today. So, absolutely. Yeah. And so, what got you interested in the field of uh, religion and war culture, and how do those two things come together, actually? Thanks. That's a that's the place to start, isn't yeah. it? Uh, <laughs> you know, I I have been working in this area for a long time, since not long after the events of 9-11. Mm-hmm. So, as we know, we are going to be remembering the 20th anniversary of 9-11 this, this coming September. But I was, I was really exploring the collision of religion and violence related to U.S. war culture, but also more specifically related to the experience of marginalized populations, specifically um, women and, and also immigrants and, and people of color. And um, just prior to 9-11, I had been examining theological literature that was raising important criticisms about the rhetoric and the, um, the logic of sacrifice in Christianity and the way in which that language and that logic often has devastating consequences for people who are marginalized. So I was very sensitized to, to these ideas and to this language. I, I would love for you to say more about that, uh, the how does the language and a logic around the sacrifice affect people that you're that you're researching? Uh, well, now the the continuation of my research over these years has taken me to the point of a similar sort of investigation, but with respect to um, active duty military service members and veterans. So there's kind of a continuum. What I discovered and what I studied, was that there, there really was a growing body of what I would call a social analysis of the way in which Christianity has really p- played a destructive role in the lives of far too many people and relegated them to a kind of dehumanized status, to people who will disproportionately bear the brunt of the costs of ways of violence in the world. And then that same kind of dynamic is, is sacralized by way of connecting it to, um, frankly, Jesus's um, sacrifice, to to the language of Jesus of Nazareth's experience on the cross. And what what I discovered is that once that kind of sacralization, once that connection has taken place, it has a way of completely blocking any further critical analysis. Um, Because once something is made sacred, it becomes untouchable. It becomes uh, removed from the possibility of, of criticism. People tend not to criticize things that they hold sacred. And I was reading literature um, and, and really learning so much from other scholars about the way, for instance, that these kinds of formulations have impacted black women or the, uh, particularly the poor in many parts of Central and, and South America, 
and, and others as well. As I say, it really did sensitize me to a, a, an incredibly important problem in Christianity, but simultaneously a problem that both then and now has not begun to be addressed <laughs> by mainstream denominations of any sort. So that's where I was 20 years ago. But then, and, and I was planning to kind of continue that work. <laughs> but then, as, you, as we all know, the events of 9-11 took place, and there was um, an important shift that took place in the culture of the United States that I really noticed. It was, it was like a frontal assault to my awareness. And again, I think that my own experience had sensitized me so that I saw and experienced this maybe much more powerfully than many other people. But as people of my age or older will recall, who had conscious awareness at that time, and I think that's important to say because now, particularly in the context of teaching in an institution of higher education, the people that I'm teaching, don't, they, they don't remember this shift. The world of post-9-11 war culture that we live in is the only world they've ever known. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really a daunting and sobering reality that I face as a teacher in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, I remember very distinctly that the United States very quickly determined that it was going to war. And all of a sudden, the language of needing to go to war as a necessary sacrifice was everywhere. It was on the lips of U.S. political leaders. It was certainly the language that was surging to the surface in military cultures, but also in popular culture. All of the sudden, all of the kinds of civil religious rituals that connect what happens in churches with what happens in civic spaces emphasize this kind of language. And I was really, frankly, confused but also disturbed. And I started looking into it. And I, I really wanted to understand what was happening here. What was this surging connection between the determination to embrace a violent response and this rhetoric and the logic of sacrifice that was so seamlessly connected with it? And that's what really launched me on the path of the investigation and and work that I've been doing now for the last 20 years. It gives us a really good basis from which to jump into a lot of different areas. I want to invite <clears throat> Michael Negler to uh, ask the next question. You seem like you're moving around a bit in your chair over here, Michael. <laughs> you know me so well, Stephanie. Good, good morning or good afternoon, Kelly. Good morning, Michael. You know, I, I had a, a, a friend, a, actually a, a teaching assistant of mine, didn't, in that 9-11 period uh, when the president of the United States proudly announced, I'm the war president. Mm -hmm. And this, this young fellow said, you know, we have a war economy, a war president, and a war culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering if, if you would agree with me in seeing that as both perhaps a cause and an effect of mass uh, traumatization, that to put oneself on that path is hurtful to us, uh, regardless of what else we do to other individuals and other cultures. It just seems like such a recipe for, for mass traumatization. And what would be the way out of it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, I, I think you're so right in identifying that. But but that is an insight that and I wonder if, if you agree with this, that that I see remains mm -hmm. incredibly hidden, incredibly concealed, incredibly absent from wider awareness in, in our culture. And maybe we can get into talking a bit more about moral injury. But what I came to understand about moral injury was that it had the potential to be a flashpoint to reveal exactly what you're talking about, Michael, um, the, the kind of deep traumatization, and, and I would say moral traumatization, that attends the embrace of violence. And for that reason, uh, I realized that exploring and broadening the, the discourse uh, about 
the realities of moral injury on the part of active duty and, and military veterans perhaps had the potential to break through that wall of denial and concealment that is so powerful, that is so strong, that's like it's like a cement wall in, in U.S. culture. And, and I also believe that that's not accidental, that mm. that attends the reality of war culture itself. It's necessary. Yeah. It's necessary for the maintenance of war culture, for there to be that kind of barrier, that kind of denial, that kind of concrete wall. Uh, there actually, if I'm not mistaken, there was an army psychiatrist who was talking about uh, what we now call moral injury, and he actually said, we do not dare talking about this in the military because it would compromise or cancel an absolutely essential activity, namely war. Well, it's been very enlightening to me to explore the range of responses to the phenomenon of what is now called moral injury across members of the military. Um, and I, I find a range of responses. I write about one high-ranking military commander who described the, the language of moral injury as an insult <laughs> because he believed that it suggested that what people do in the military is morally suspect. And for him, that was absolutely wrong and dangerous to even consider that kind of an idea that from his perspective, what people in the military do is ethical, it's moral. Yeah. And even to raise the specter of moral injury could damage that perspective. And so it was an insult and, and dangerous. But I've also encountered the writing and the, the thought of other members of the military for whom the language of moral injury is incredibly important and revealing. And, you know, these are these I'm, I'm thinking, for instance, of Douglas Pryor, who is yeah. co-editor with um, Bob Maher of Moral Injury, a reader and I've so appreciated and, and learned a lot from Douglas Pryor's writing um, over the years because he really, he really understands that moral injury names a, a very important experience that so many, including himself, have had and that it raises really uncomfortable questions that, once again, uh, military institutions are having a difficult time dealing with adequately. Well, why don't we dive into that, Kelly? What is what is moral injury? So, I have a a, a number of of definitions that that I like to use. One one definition that that comes from my colleague, who is a, a military chaplain with the VA in Philadelphia. He he describes moral injury as a kind of uh, betrayal, which is really fundamental to the experience of, of moral injury, moral injury as a betrayal of one's own deepest moral values, as well as a sense of being betrayed by others. And I, I take that a step further because I really want us to think about moral injury and its embeddedness in what I call U.S. war culture. And so I talk about moral injury as, as something that arises out of participation in the moral distortion of the world that is created by war. And in that sense, uh, I really want to encourage us to think about moral injury, not only as an individual experience, but as something with much deeper roots in collective world building, <laughs> mm -hmm. collective human world building. That is a superb definition. Kelly, I really, I really like that very much. It's very helpful. There's one more that I might just share with you that I've, I've recently come across again and just so appreciate. This comes from my, uh, Michael Yandel who is a, um, a, a veteran of the Iraq War, but also a, a Ph.D. in, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure the area of religious studies that he's a Ph.D. in, but he describes moral injury from a very personal point of view as despair of myself and of the world. And I just find that to be such a powerful definition. Well, I'd like to explore, too, the idea of back to the betrayal, not just of the act of having somebody betray you, 
But uh, uh, Michael has written a lot about this, the relationship between nonviolence and what's known as the new story of human nature. And Michael, I wonder if you could speak to that here as well, like <clears throat> how you would define, you know, that betrayal as a betrayal of a human nature. Uh, exactly. That is my uh, mm. approach. And, and that's why sometimes you may you may agree with me here also, Kelly, that the, the term moral it, it, it's not the most descriptive. It, it doesn't sound scientific. And one of our regents uh, at UC Berkeley once, once said that science is still the knowledge validating information system of our culture. So a term like moral or soul you know they're very hard hitting and and they 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 hit you right in the gut so to speak but mm-hmm. they're a little bit uh, they're hard to get a handle on and I, and I wonder if you've had that experience too that uh, I know exactly what you mean by moral injury and that betrayal of who we think we are is where I fit into this kind of thinking because uh my my work most recently has been on the overlap between nonviolence and what we call the new story of human nature, which is that we are body, mind, and spirit, and on the level of spirit, we're all connected, to say the very least. And it's that tearing of that connection in a very deep internal way that it ends up being what we call moral injury. So please respond to all of that. You know, I come from the perspective that the best learning we can do about this is to actually listen to the voices of people who are are willing, who who have gathered the courage despite the disapproval of war culture to actually speak honestly about their experiences. Mm -hmm. And what I have found is that they are the ones who use this language of soul and they are the ones who who use the language of feeling as though this deepest sense of who they are as human beings has been eviscerated. And and they use the language of soul to describe that. So I follow them. And as someone, (laughs) as a scholar and a teacher who has been deeply rooted in the humanities my entire life, (laughs) I believe that in addition to everything that the sciences, both social and natural sciences, have to teach us, we have learned, and especially in this recent age of the pandemic, we have learned that ignoring or in any way diminishing the power of the humanities comes only at our own peril. We need to listen to human existential stories, narratives, experiences, the arts, uh, and um, and so that's really the approach that, that I bring to the table. I'd, I'd love to step back to something we were talking about at the beginning of this interview, mm-hmm. and that's of the topic of sacrifice. And, and I guess I want to sort of throw this on the table for both you and Michael, because uh, I know Michael has some things to say about it. No, I've worked with Michael for some time. But there's an initiative in Catholicism right now called the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, and they're trying to get back essentially to the nonviolent Jesus. And in Christianity, you know, that the act of sacrifice, you know, it is sacred, the, the, the crucifixion is sacred symbolism. How it's been misrepresented or, or co opted, I think, um, starting with like the Emperor Constantine you know, turning, you know, the Roman Empire into the the Holy Christian Empire, uh, where the the, the sacrifice of Jesus became war culture. Mm -hmm. How can we still appreciate, you know, the the sacred uh, process of, you know, of of spiritual sacrifice, of self-sacrifice for a cause that's bigger than oneself without getting entangled and, and, and injured in war culture, how do we engage with sacrificing uh, or a sacred process of sacrifice that does connect one to a prophet, to a, a clear spiritual leader in a way that somebody that you look to for guidance 
without getting in, in, in meshed and entangled in work culture? I might start by just putting on the table a really important phrase that is at the heart of this, this deep connection between work culture and sacrifice. And you, I'm sure you both know it, dulce et decorum es pro patria mori. Um, it is sweet and honorable to die for one's country. Um, that goes back to the Roman poet Horace, but it's been a, a regular theme that has emerged, especially um, across the pages of Western history. And it certainly frames, um, it frames, I would say, the, the, the core of U.S. nationalism, the way that people understand what it means to be a citizen of the United States, right? So this is, this is extremely troubling because of the way that that then is lived out, the consequences of that, the demands of that. And, you know, I, I am well aware of a whole range of responses to the, the, the dangerous actualities of, of sacrifice mm -hmm. among Christian theologians mm -hmm. and practitioners. I will say that I tend to follow one thinker in particular on this, and, um, and that is Dolores Williams, a womanist theologian who's no longer with us, but whose work from the 1990s and on I have learned so much from and, and just find truly powerful. Mm -hmm. So Dolores Williams mobilized a, a, a social analysis of the effects of sacrifice and surrogacy in the lives of black women. So what she was asking was, how do these notions of a, a supposedly altruistic sacrifice that Jesus makes on the cross, how do these notions find application to the actual lives of black women? And what she discovered was that those religious ideas in practice reified, cemented, exacerbated black women's unjust suffering in the world. Mm -hmm. So they, they were required to emulate Jesus through incredibly ugly, racist formulations mm -hmm. as the mammy, as the sexual surrogate, or as the field slave in each way, finding themselves at the, um, at the mercy of um, racist social patterns that were then sacralized and reified by these religious patterns. Mm -hmm. That's really a powerful, powerful criticism. And where she arrived after sitting with that and writing about that and thinking about that, was that she um, ultimately could only say that what happens with Jesus on the cross is that it shows the ugliness and the power and the destructive consequences of sin, of human sin, of human evil. That's what the cross exemplifies. And she really did not want to attribute some sort of positive or worthy of emulation sort of mm -hmm. dynamic mm -hmm. coming out of the cross, at least for her and for the lives of, of black women for whom she was writing. In other words, that the dangers outweighed any potential for finding something positive or, or worthy of emulation. Mm. Perhaps the, the structural violence that the, the institutions themselves that we're living under that have co-opted sacrifice to such an extent have just, it seems to be what I hear you saying, is have made it impossible for sacrifice to represent anything else other than uh, an oppressive um, action, because what's the highest form of sacrifice is, uh, form of sacrifice is, uh, is helping to people oppressed, it's helping to impose sacrifice for state and nation through war, and it's just, it goes on and on. I think you're right, Stephanie, that this is deeply embedded in all, all sorts of structural forms of violence. Um, one finds it in, in again, uh, especially 
on steroids in military cultures, but I've I've traced it in every um, in, in in every presidential administration, in speeches, in rituals. It's in popular culture. I write about this at length in my books. This is, in fact, <laughs> over the 9/11 period. I, I began what I began to refer to as a perverse hobby <laughs> of collecting examples of sacrificial war culture because it's, it's not only structural violence, it's also very, very deeply cultural violence. And cultural violence is the hardest kind of violence for people to actually see. It, it's normalized. It's legitimated. It's the water that we swim in as fish in a watery culture. Uh, and, and so we simply tend to take it for granted. It's pre-reflective, in other words. We are born into it and absorb it, even though it's simultaneously a human construction. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's in inc incredibly destructive, incredibly costly. Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm, I, I feel like I'm finally, it's, it's finally landing on me all of the things that we've been talking about. But I was looking at a former president's uh, uh, website or their their blog that was then uh, stopped. He stopped writing for the blog a while ago. I won't say who it was, but he imagined this great American nation as, as he said it, as a Christian nation, and that imagination of the United States as a Christian nation. There's an intentional logic there because of the way that sacrifice plays in and, and fuels nationalism and fuels racism and fuels oppression that benefits those in power. Well, this is this is true, and just as as one one brief example, John, I believe it's fifteen thirteen. There is no greater love than this than to lay down one's life for a friend. Mm -hmm. This is a verse that is continually exploited mm -hmm. <laughs> in political cultures, in military cultures, in popular culture, as a way of referencing what happens in the fields of war when soldiers are wounded or when they die. There are, there are a number of problems with that. First of all, it's completely um, wrongheaded in terms of association with the actual life of Jesus of Nazareth, who, as biblical scholars agree, rejected militarized violence. <laughs> so sometimes I have asked, how did a nonviolent Messiah become the template for what soldiers do in war? Mm -hmm. That's really a, a cognitive distortion, right. but it's one that, again, because this is so normalized, we tend not to ask those questions. So it's it's really it's really wrong headed, you know, on 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 that score. Uh, but I have found that it's common practice in war culture for biblical verses like that one to be exploited mm -hmm. uh, in the service of war culture, and I can point to lots of examples in terms of how that has happened, one really powerful example comes from the administration of former President Trump and his first speech to both houses of co of Congress when just a, a short while before that time, uh, Navy SEAL Ryan Owens had, had died in a, an order for armed coerced force that Trump had ordered in Yemen that resulted in deaths and the loss of military equipment and, and Owen's own death. And there was a lot of criticism that surged in the culture, including from Ryan's own father, who was also a military veteran. Trump knew that he was in trouble, and he and his advisors got together, and this speech was planned. And at a key moment in the speech, and by the way, I should say that only Owen's widow was invited to have a special seat in the balcony, but not the father who had raised this criticism. At a particular moment in the speech, Trump turned to the widow and reiterated that verse from the Gospel of John. And she raised her eyes to the heavens. Uh, her eyes were filled with tears. It was a very, you know, gut-wrenching moment. But what happened was that all of the criticism then just simply died. <laughs> it, was, it was a very effective use of this sort of sacralization process to quell criticism and to change the narrative. Mm. And this is what happens over and over and over again. And it's intentional. It's, it's effective. Um, and even members of the media 
after that speech, began to refer to Trump as, as having done something that was really presidential. Mm. You know, so um, what, what, what I would like to call for is for members of the nonviolence community to really become much more sophisticated in terms of seeing these kinds of dynamics and calling them out, calling out the exploitation of the use of, of sacrificial verses in the Bible and the ways that they are used in war culture, calling out the language and the, the, the logic of sacrifice and actually lifting up the destructive consequences of actual sacrificial dynamics that are endemic to war culture. Mm. I think that as people who care about nonviolence and who are frankly so often characterized as naive about um, the world and about the dangers of the world, nonviolent actors, I would love to see become much more sophisticated mm. about calling out the naivete of those who claim that violence works. Mm and those who uh, unashamedly resort to these kinds of references to religion to sacralize, undergird, and frankly conceal the, the, the real process and the real consequences of the use of violence. Kelly, that is really, really thought-provoking, and you have awakened the slumbering classicist in me by quoting Horace. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wanted to share another quote that, that would shed some light on exactly what we were talking about. Uh, unfortunately, because I'm not a functioning classicist right now, I can't remember who this comes from, but it's corruptio optimum pessima. That means the perversion, if you will, the corruption of that which is best becomes the worst. Yeah. Precisely in the way that you were describing, that we, that we use the sacral nature of violence to sacralize exactly what Jesus was trying to show us was an offense against the order of the universe. I, mm. I, I'm speaking somewhat now as a, as a Jewish person. It took me decades to finally discover Jesus mm. <laughs> underneath mm. all that rhetoric and distortion. And it, it just seems to me that he... He allowed himself to be taken in that uh, horrendous act in order to show how bad it was and that you should never do it. And yet, as Stephanie was pointing out, we have all these institutionalized forms for pre preserving the victimization of others rather than the uh, sacrifice of oneself when necessary. And, and I add that last part as a nonviolence person because there is a trend that you sometimes see people who want to validate their own moral standing by letting themselves be victimized without realizing right. that, they, you know, they're just perpetuating the system. Yeah. You know, Michael, I think you and I could have a long conversation. <laughs> This, this might be it, <laughs> about right? <laughs> all of this, and and I, I bet I could learn a lot from you. But because I I also am a, a student of of nonviolence philosophy, and one of the questions that I struggle with has to do with what I perceive to be a, a conflict among some of the principles of nonviolence. Mm. So, for instance, one of the principles has to do with um, with honoring all life, right? And another has to do with the ends needing to, the, the means and the ends needing to cohere, right? Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that self sacrifice conflicts with those principles. And so mm -hmm. I, I really have questions about, and I, I, I honestly, I, this is something that I'm still really thinking about and I, I hope to write about. I wonder when and if um, we ever want to really recommend self-sacrifice? Boy, that, that, that is a really good question. I don't go around recommending it. Uh, I think the important difference, unfortunately, between the optimum and the pessimum is the what you go into it for. If, if you go into it in order to be martyred, you're participating in the sacrificial system. 
Because as, as you know, and as René Girard has pointed out, when you sacrifice an animal in ancient cultures, you had to get the animal's approval. <laughs> so you, you, you say to a sheep, is it okay? Would you like to be sacrificed? And then you sprinkle some water on the poor creature's head, and it shakes his head left and right, which if you've traveled in Greece, you know that's a way of saying yes. And so, so right. So we. So that's essentially a fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> that, oh yeah. <laughs> that the sheep ever really offers yeah. any kind of of assent to to this process, and I guess I wonder in in I I really um, have learned so much from sociologists of religion with respect to sacrificial systems, and and so I guess it raises for me the question that living in. I, I have never lived other than in a war culture. I'm a citizen of the United States. I was born here. War culture definitely precedes the United States, but it seems to me that ours is the the largest and the most dominant war culture that the globe has ever known. Sometimes I say that the war culture uh, of the United States makes what happened in the Roman Empire look like child's play. So I wonder... Given that, given my own embeddedness in this culture, is it possible for me ever to sort of rise above and find some sort of way to participate in self-sacrifice that truly demonstrates my consent? <laughs> I'm not sure that there is. Mm -hmm. I think we all of us are so deeply affected by this. And for that reason, again, I would follow Dolores Williams in really trying to underline and uh, emphasize the costs of sacrificial war culture. I think I, I find that I think that's where we are in our culture, mm -hmm. with the need to underscore these dangerous consequences, these dangerous practices. And I'm not sure that there's really a way to demonstrate active and free consent mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of of self sacrifice. Well, when I think of when I think of sacrifice, just to to expand it slightly. Uh, and living and being born in a war culture like the United States, I think of people who at some point decide that they just that they do not want to live any longer in a world like this. And mm -hmm. so they're going to give their entire life to changing it. And there's this kind of focus that people get and a, a, a one pointedness. And, and it's almost a despair that no mm -hmm. longer can I live in a world like this. And instead of going the route of, of direct suicide, people then decide to dedicate themselves to a cause for the rest of their lives or to ending mm. and, and, and to putting themselves in the way, going, going into other war zones, uh, going into places where the United States imperialism is doing acts of, of horror and, and, mm -hmm. and, and bearing witness I see that as a as a kind of a of a sacrificial life in a way, but but maybe I'm I'm confounding it with just the sense of the word courage. I mean, how do we how do we distinguish between moral courage and sacrifice? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I listen to you, what what's coming to mind for me is that the kind the individuals that you're describing are searching for um, a pathway of authentic living mm. how does one find an authentic life mm. in the midst of uh, a culture that is um so anti-life mm. right and you know the the other thing that comes to mind for me is that and i i've often been quizzical about this why is it that we so much in the united states as well as in other places we tend to define what we most value by our willingness to die for it. Mm. The, the people that you are describing are searching for a pathway of living, not necessarily dying. Right, exactly. <laughs> and every chosen pathway comes with foreseeable and unforeseeable consequences and um, events, and right? Mm -hmm. So we, 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 we can never foresee in advance exactly how it's all going to turn out, but it still seems to me as though the individuals that you are describing are really searching for a way to live and mm -hmm. to live fully yeah. and to live authentically and wholly. And that reminds me of 
at least some of the, the voices of morally injured veterans that I've been listening to in these recent years who find themselves now on a pathway of searching for a different way to live. Mm-hmm. And there is a, for instance, at the, in this moral injury um, program that is based in the, the VA hospital in Philadelphia, the Michael Crescent's VA hospital, a moral injury leadership group has formed of, of veterans who have worked their way through that program. And they are searching for a different way of living than that which they were acculturated into and shaped so deeply by um, over their years of, um, of, of military service. And one of the things that they have dedicated themselves to is challenging the military industrial complex. So they, they are coming, they have come to the understanding that this is not simply an individual problem but a problem that is rooted in much deeper systems and structures that have to be challenged and mm-hmm. called out and changed. That's authentic living. It might not be easy living. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it might not be painless living, but it's living. Uh, you, you know, uh, Kelly is uh, thinking now of some other work that's been done on the value of work and how working together mm. with others uh, is the f- greatest form of bonding, of forming a beloved community. And it also, I have been thinking all along in this conversation, it's the only way out for morally injured people is to take up some reparation work. And that's why Mm. you see Vietnam vets, you know, going back to Vietnam and building schools and hospitals and things like that. And it, I do have the feeling that there's got to be a way out for those poor people who, in a way, are victims of our war culture, that the, the injured veterans that you're describing, and that they have to find a way of repairing the harm that they've done. And that that was the only way, I think, that they can repair the injury that they've experienced in the course of doing it. Right. Yeah, um, I agree with you, and I'm and I'm hearing that so profoundly in the stories, and as I'm observing the lives of again some of these people who I have learned about from this particular moral injury group in Philadelphia, and and from moral injury literature um, overall, in this moral injury program in Philadelphia that has been developed by a remarkable chaplain and, and psychologist. It's a 12-week program, and in week 10, they have a community ceremony. And the purpose of the ceremony is to bring together, it, and it really it's symbolically, all of the different sectors of society to address this reality and respond to it. So there are veterans there, but there are also members of their friends and families, and then other civilians and What's important is that the civilians and the friends and family have expressly dedicated themselves to be willing to listen. So, you know, a huge part of the problem for those returning veterans, as well as people who are active service, is that we in the United States, and this is also a consequence of our war culture, we engage in what this chaplain, Chris Antal, and psychologist Peter Yeomans call work avoidance. <laughs> we find ways not to face the, the, the voices, the stories, the realities that these people might otherwise share with us. But in this ceremony, the, the central act is for these, these, these people to stand and give testimony to their experiences. And along the lines of precisely what you're saying, Michael, this means lament. And it means also honestly confessing and speaking publicly about things that are incredibly difficult to talk about. But what they're asked to share is shaped around two questions. They are asked to share in response to the question, what do you most need to unburden yourself of? Mm. And then the second question is, what do people most need to hear? And this ceremony then also involves people, civilians like like me, 
who come to listen and who are asked not only to listen, but to figure out how to take more responsibility for this reality. I think that the the phenomenon of moral injury, and again, it's complex, because yes, it involves individual choices that people have made in their lives, but it also involves much deeper systems and a much deeper culture that ha- that you know also bears responsibility for our reality. And so I would say that that all of us need to be involved and it's not only it's not only lament and reparations that need to happen on the part of those who were the at the at the tip of uh, horrific things that have happened but all of the rest of us as well <laughs> who equally bear responsibility um, and naming that shared responsibility and then taking it on and dealing with it um, is what is called for, I believe. Wow. Uh, you, you know, Kelly, that puts me very powerfully in mind of a principle that was discovered by René Girard, which I, I'm sure you're familiar with mm-hmm. in his work, you know, Violence of the Sacred and so forth. That is, the entire machinery of sacrifice is designed to be certain that you never hear from the victims. And Mm -hmm. the minute you hear from a victim, the system collapses. And he he takes the book of Job as what should have been a turning (laughs) point to get us out of all of this when, when Job actually says, hey... You know, you guys, you can do whatever you want to me, but I did not do anything wrong. And so mm-hmm. to to hear that it kind of pulls the foundations out from under the the sacrificial system. And unfortunately, uh, we haven't quite gotten it. The reason I'm very encouraged by our conversation here today is it seems to me that, you know, I go back a ways and I can't remember moral injury ever being talked about. And so the fact that it's coming out in the open now means that we are doing that one thing that you ha- you could have to do to disestablish a system of sacrifice, which is to listen to the victims, which is what you're doing. Mm, that's beautifully said. Yeah, I, I think I think you put that really well. I, I really appreciate that because, yes, the whole system depends on the violence somehow being concealed or somehow being hidden. And once you begin to bring that to the surface, you're right, I think you're right that the whole system begins to fall apart. I also wanted to say that, you know, the terminology of moral injury was coined by Jonathan Shea around 2009. But the phenomenon that the terminology of moral injury refers to has been traced by scholars all the way back to ancient Greece. So Moral injury is understood by scholars to probably be as old as war itself. Mm. Um, but the, the coining of this language for it really has been a, an incredibly important step forward um, in terms of understanding, but also in terms of address of this reality. And what happened after, after Shea initiated this is that research and investigation of moral injury just began to take off. And there still is just this amazing tsunami, really, of moral injury research that is going on all over the place. And I see that as an incredibly positive um, step toward naming and, and, and then claiming a different reality, insisting that something different has to be done. Mm-hmm. And again, that's why I, I really see this as a flashpoint. And what What I have tried to do in in my own work is to emphasize that as important as it is to investigate and and try to ameliorate moral injury on an individual basis, and that has happened especially through methodologies of psychology, as important as all that is, that's just a starting point. If we're really going to address moral injury, we have to look to its deeper rootedness in the structures that we human beings are responsible for having constructed and in our cultures. And that's the deep work Mm. that I hope more people will take up. Thank you so much, Kelly, for joining us today on Nonviolence Radio. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for having me. 
You're at Nonviolence Radio, and we've been speaking with Kelly Denton Borhog. She's been investigating how religion and violence collide in American war culture, and she teaches in the Global Religions Department at Moravian University. She's the author of two books, uh, U.S. War Culture, Sacrifice and Salvation, and more recently, And Then Your Soul is Gone, Moral Injury and U.S. War Culture. We want to thank our mother station, KWMR, for hosting Nonviolence Radio. We want to thank Matt Watrous for transcribing the show, Brian Farrell at Waging Nonviolence for sharing our show with the wider public, our friends at Pacifica who help syndicate our show and all of our listeners. Thank you very much. We want to thank Kelly for joining us today. And um, to everybody out there, please take care of one another. Have a good weekend.